building metal wings to fly won't take you to the stars. Use the metal for a boat and you won't sail too far. Stop sitting in the dark, stirring metal pots about. You will change your life forever when you figure out. The secret code, 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 Science can be tricky, it can overheat your brain. Science can be hard to chew, each bite can be a pain. Stop sitting in the dark, stirring metal pots about. You will change your life forever when you figure out. The secret code. Five hundred and six, five hundred and seven. Think of the wonder of it all. Trillions of stars and planets and moons just waiting to be explored. With those kind of odds, it's insane to think we're alone out there. There must be so much life. And that's just our very small, underambitious calculations. Can't you just hear the possibilities? Not really. All I hear is a yakking moose and eight. You're not taking this nine, seriously. And ten. Eleven. Have it your way. I can see you're pursuing something much more scientific. Well, fine. I guess the universe can just wait. Hey! <sighs> Actually, dominoes are also a way of studying life. Sure. <laughs> and I bet Einstein just played hopscotch all day. No, really. <laughs> Take a look. It only takes one domino falling over to affect the rest of them. That's how life works. Everything is connected, kind of like a big web. And big things, too. Every action has consequence. A litter bug's oh. banana peel could mean a painful slip for someone else. Oh. A little sneeze could spread a big disease. Ouch. Actions can set off chain reactions. Things spiral from there. It's the domino effect. Your theory only affects simpler organisms who aren't in control of their fate. But we have more power. We alone control our futures. An absurd theory. Plus, you forgot I don't even eat bananas. I will say, at least you've tried to justify this silly game. <sighs> Calm your antlers and let me enjoy something. I'm trying to beat my old record here. Maybe you could find a hobby that doesn't take up the whole floor. Oh, look, how about a garden? Or better yet, one potted plant. Wait, no, stop! <laughs> no, 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 no! Stop arguing and buckle up! <laughs> Our new hobby is dodging asteroids! Ah, <laughs> uh, and I was just a few away from beating my record. <laughs> you losing your own record is your own fault. If you had just asked Finn, you would have probably known we'd be traveling through an asteroid belt. That domino theory of yours is debunked. Really, <laughs> fate is only up to us. You losing your new record is just due to bad luck. Mm. My book on gardens! Seems your book falling is your own bad luck, eh? Impact imminent. Prepare for immediate and painful landing. Ah. Oh, I think I sprained my allula. Don't be crass, pig. You have arrived at your destination. Initiating auto seatbelt unbuckling. No! Don't unbuckle the seatbelts yet! <laughs> ah! oh. Well, seems we're in a bit of a pickle, boys. And by pickle, I mean crater on an asteroid. Splendid. My favorite place. Uh, where's Daco? You crazy? Come back! I'm not going on a wild moose chase. Phenomenal stuff. Yeah. Huh? Holy smokes! This place is dangerously radioactive. Taco, huh? get back here now. There's hmm. radiation. 
After scanning our location, I found extremely high levels of radioactive uranium here. So whoever lived on this planet before had terrible waste management. Or there's just uranium. Can the radiation reach us on board? We're fine. We have a shield. It just takes up a lot of power from the mainframe. If I may interject, while you two wax on the dangers of radioactivity, I'll be outside exploring the ruins of an amazing asteroid society. Did you lose? Your mind in the crash? The uranium is the reason they're ruins. You want to join them? Because that's what'll happen. Then you and Pin stay behind and figure out how to get us out of here. If it makes you feel any better, I'll wear an extra suit. Or three. <laughs> no can do. Without radiation protection, three suits are just as useless as one. You win. No. I'll go explore the ruins and I'll do it without any kind of protection. I sacrifice myself in the name of science. <laughs> <laughs> This is for the study of interstellar anthropology. Don't you get it? And it's so close. A chance like this only comes once. Oh, just one minute's all I ask. Come on, you guys. Well, we have a day. That's how long our power will last. We'll just make it work. Somehow we've got to get outside the ship and analyze how to get out of here. I'm pretty sure that's the bigger problem. <laughs> Fix the ship. Hmm. I don't hear Darko. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's just sad. It's not that we're not curious about the ruins, we just don't want to die. You know, the radiation thing. <laughs> This place is the pinnacle of my life's research. Oh. I refuse to let you two bird brains deprive me of this achievement. Go! Go! Okay, pal. You're about to get in school. It was your book full of flowers that you left on the table. That caused one of the flowers to fly over the pin, which made him sneeze. And where did that lead us? All right, we crashed. And now we're on this rock somewhere in space. That is what you call a chain reaction. My word, that's it! We're all saved! A chain reaction! <laughs> First, we'll start a fire. We'll just light this. Light it. Light it. <coughs> light it! <laughs> ah! <laughs> fire is a great example of chain reactions. The fire consumes more and grows, and energy is created as a result. That's how our ancestors first utilized different forms of energy. They burned fuel and used reactions from that. What do you suggest? Burn down the ship? Cut our losses? No, we have a powerful material right at our fingertips. Uranium. Uranium is a fascinating element. It's extremely dense and heavy because it has so many protons and electrons inside a single atom. But if we add one electron, that messes up the whole balance. It'll split, and that releases energy. Wait, we're splitting one tiny atom? How much energy could that make? It makes a super chain reaction. When one atom of uranium splits into two parts, it makes two free neutrons. Then those two neutrons fly to the nearest atoms and do the same thing to those guys. They break them apart and they break more apart, and those neutrons break even more, and it makes a domino effect. And that wonderful reaction is called a nuclear chain reaction. Something like that is dangerous, bordering on utter madness. We don't have the technology. We can't control that kind of reaction. Well, I never said we need to control the reaction. Ah! <gasps> Are you telling me you would blow the planet up? Why would you do that? Am I missing something important here? What happens in an uncontrolled nuclear reaction? Big explosions happen. Pin is trying to destroy the planet with us on it. No, we'll be fine. We have shields. And our ship will finally be free. But what about the ruins? Listen, I'm sorry, but this seems like our best shot. Oh. Radiation shields activated to maximum level. 
Nuclear launch ready for initiation. Activating Code Penguin. Nuclear launch sequence. This whole thing was worse than just the domino effect. This is more like the butterfly effect. You pick a flower, and the next thing you know, we've engaged World War XII on a planet. It's a shame, really. I almost agreed with you about those ruins. Wait, what's that? Look, there! Oh, we just made a wormhole. A break in time and space, probably caused by our nuclear reactor. Hold on, time and space? We can use this to go back in time and change the course of events, thereby saving the planet! <laughs> Aha! So you do believe in the domino effect. You know, if we change the course of events as we did them, we probably won't find the planet. Oh, as long as we save it, that's what's important. Years from now, we may find this planet again. And then I'll be able to explore that city for real. Hopefully next time we won't, you know, blow them to smithereens. <laughs> ah, aren't you a fine floral specimen? I believe I'll start to dry flowers in my gardening book. Huh? Oh! Huh? Oh! The discovery of nuclear chain reactions is credited to Nikolai Nikolaevich Semyonov and Cyril Hinchelwood. They each received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1956. But it was an Italian scientist named Enrico Fermi who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1938 for learning about nuclear decomposition. Attention, all systems overloaded. Attention, power shortage. All systems are overloaded. Attention, not enough power for takeoff. Looks like all it's not gonna work. Well, that only confirms Attention. our theory. If even the spaceship takeoff. couldn't. Can somebody Energy tell me what's going on? Oh, Pig, how did we not notice him? Cancel takeoff! Takeoff cancelled to recalculate flight capabilities. What have you done over here? Everything's okay. We just decided to visit the ruins of an ancient town and do one little experiment. What sort of experiment? And where the devil are we? <gasps> we'll have to tell him everything. But then don't be sorry that you asked. Ben, didn't you ever think it was foolish to look for a reasonable life somewhere in space when so many unknown secrets remain on our own native planet? And all pointing to the fact that past civilizations were helped by some sort of extraterrestrial. We are all so used to the world around us that we don't pay attention to all the unexplainable things that actually surround us. For example, can anyone explain who's always tangling up our headphones? Or who built the Egyptian pyramids? Someone will say, why the Egyptians, of course, but that would be wrong. Each such pyramid is made of such huge slabs of stone, just enormous in size. For such constructions, they've even given its own special name, Megalith. Chico, give us some numbers. 
Why do I always have to do the boring numbers? And you get to talk about the most powerful truck in the world. They're not boring numbers. They're super pooper figures that make your brain explode. And only you can make them sound cool, Spikey. And anyway, I was never the best with numbers. Well, I don't know. I could give it a try. <laughs> The Pyramids of Cheops, the maximum weight of a block is 15 tons. In the Pyramid of Khafre, the maximum weight of a stone block is 42 tons. And finally, the champion, the Pyramid of Mikarin, the maximum weight of a one block is, one second, 200 tons. Thanks, Chico. Now think about it. How could the Egyptians move such huge items without electricity or cranes? But that's not all. Get ready to have your mind blown away. The Temple of Jupiter and the ancient town of Baalbek. At its base, there are three stones called trilithons, which are perfectly crafted stones with an absolutely perfect shape. Chico! The dimensions of each slab are about four meters in width and height, and in length, about 20 meters. They weigh 800 tons. Yes, these are the most super mega huge structures on the planet. Such a megalith can't even be carved with modern day technology, let alone them being moved from one place to the other. Currently, the loading capacity of the most powerful truck in the world is only 400 tons. So right now we're in that Bula the Bala in uh, Balpec, in the temple ruins of Jupiter. And these are the heftiest colossal stones. Now all that remains is to lift one of them into orbit. Some people think that the Trilithons are huge transmitters of antiquity, which were left here on our planet by extraterrestrials. Uh-huh. Or they were created by an ancient race of titans. But I like the one about the extraterrestrial transmitters more. This is all very interesting, but what did you actually want to do with them? To transmit them, we need to raise the megalith higher and send a signal out to our distant intellectual kinfolk. <laughs> Transmitters. <laughs> Not everyone can handle left by the extraterrestrials. <laughs> Necessary power for takeoff found from alternative connection. Starting countdown. Five. Nine. Abort. Take off. Four. <laughs> three. Two. One. Take off. Computer. Abort. Take off. Ben, what's up? What you want to ruin our experiment? Request denied. All power switched to previous task. <laughs> Don't worry so much, Pin. <laughs> we calculated everything. When we get out into space, we'll go into zero gravity and everything will be lighter. Fasten <gasps> your seatbelts. Prepare for turbulence. Attention, energy overload, flight interrupted. We've got to use your little super stone, or we're done for. You can't just fling away such a valuable ancient artifact. Extraterrestrial transmitters shouldn't be lying around on the road. <laughs> I'll show you another megalith. Even better than your extraterrestrial transmitter. Holy carrots! Is that a promise? Yeah, yeah. It's even got its own antenna. Oh, cool. No, 
That will work. That's a very strong knot. Otherwise, he wouldn't have held 800 tons. And what do we do now? Easier to untie it. Because you, because you told me to. So where is this other megalith that you promised to show us? The one that's even better. And with antennas. This is Palace Square in St. Petersburg. What kind of a joke is this? Where's the megalith? Right in front of your nose. Throughout our history, there are many secrets and mysteries. But there's no need to summon extraterrestrials each time. It's unscientific. While scientifically, we can look through history for other similar examples of which we know a little more. For example, the well-known Alexander Column, a real megalith, which made such an impression when it was unveiled. After all, it is made of a single piece of granite with a height of 26 meters and a mass of 600 tons. And this was also made by our ancestors, equally with no electricity and no cranes. How on earth did they manage it? Leading on the construction of the column was the wonderful architect, Auguste Montferrat. He left a lot of sketches and pictures, which depict the entire process of creating the column. First, a large piece was cut at a quarry. It took two whole years and 400 workers. The work was done with a common crowbar and a sledgehammer. One person held the crowbar and the second hit it with a sledgehammer. Then, this huge piece of stone was separated from the rock with help of some very long levers. From this square block, it was chiseled down to a beautiful round column. All of it done by hand without any magical machines. Then the column was transported to St. Petersburg by being loaded onto a special ship that could carry a lot of weight without going bull bull. Once the column arrived in St. Petersburg, it still had to be raised on Palace Square. To do this, a large lifting device was made at height of almost 50 meters. And again, all the work was done manually. The column wasn't even fixed with anything. It stays in place due to its own weight. Since then, this amazing and beautiful megalith has stood for almost 200 years. Are you saying there are no ancient titans and no extraterrestrials? <sighs> That's a bit of a letdown. <laughs> of course there were. We can see the amazing results of the work of these titans. And we are their descendants. Incoming signal from Chamomile Valley. My friends, this is phenomenal. Look what just fell on my house, literally out of the sky. This incredible object is obviously of an extraterrestrial origin. It's a sign, my friends, from our cosmic brothers. <laughs> And that is how the story ended. Mm. And as a souvenir, I was left with a lightning scar. Wow. Where? What? Where? The scar. The lightning-shaped one. Huh? Mm. On my heart, my friend. On my heart. Cool. Nothing heroic ever happens to me. Not even anything I can impress my friends with. Yum, yum, yum. Oh, adventure. That is not difficult. The important thing is to live through it strictly by the laws of dramaturgy. But how do I do that? It's elementary. The term dramaturgy comes straight out of ancient Greek. 
And it means the art of creating a dramatic work. More simply, the ability to tell an interesting story. Simply speaking, the skill of telling interesting stories. And in any self-respecting story, there has to be a hero. And any self-respecting hero must have a goal. Ha ha! Dramaturgy is very simple, but we didn't mention another important detail. <laughs> Conflict. And there are obstacles that prevent the hero from achieving his goal. Now we have the complete set. The three main components of any story. The hero, his goal, and conflict. Now, as they say, it's a complete drama. As you can see, everything is simple. You reach your goal despite all the obstacles. And that's it. The story is over. And you're a hero. But where do I find my goal? For a true hero, any small thing can become a goal. Here, for example, mm. complete this cube. Oh, that I can do. But what's so heroic about that? You're right. You need to increase the conflict. Hmm. Oh! The hero, the goal, and the conflict. It's wonderful, but in order to make the story really interesting, we still need to know how to tell an interesting story. Since Wally is a beginner hero, let's stick to the simplest version, the classical three-act structure. The first act is the setting. First, we get acquainted with the characters and the general situation. This is called exposition. Everything is, as a rule, peaceful and calm. But then there is a motivating event that unbalances the situation. The hero has a problem that pops up and the story begins. Where are we? The perfect place to have an adventure. You know, on this planet, only a real hero could find a radiant and amazing cube. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Go for it, my friend. You got it! <laughs> oh, could I just sneak back? I forgot to grab the band-aids. Oh. Not in any circumstance. Computer, switch to autopilot. We'll pick Wally up when he finds the cube. Hey, we didn't agree to this! <laughs> you! Huh? As the main hero, just got to one of the main parts in any dramatic story. The point of no return. The first act ends with the first turning point, which is also called the point of no return. The hero can no longer continue with his old methods. To achieve the goal, he will have to make an extra effort. Then the second act begins, the development of action. Well, I won't bother you. Yes, a cube will come back with you. Dramaturgy, ha, ha, ha. But, uh, where should I go? I'd hurry if I were you. Judging by my readings, there's a storm on the way. What? Uh. Uh.
darn it. Uh, I didn't get a chance to see the end of my dream. Whoa! My, my cube! I'm alive! And I'm fine! <laughs> I managed to survive the adventure! <laughs> Congratulations, my friend! Thank you! I did it! Oh yeah, you've reached the most important point in your journey. It's called False Hope. What is it called? Halfway through the second act, the hero thinks that he's progressing forwards, but he's mistaken. Further tension is added to the action and the hero is forced to increase efforts to overcome the opposition. This point is called False Hope. Still more resistance, but for the time being, everything seems to be calm. Does it not bother you that there is actually air on this planet? I'd be more bothered if there wasn't. Just the presence of air, as a rule, hints at the existence of life. What my... Ah! Oh. 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 Now that's drama. The second act is coming to an end. Josh, quiet. I'm begging you. Quiet. The most important point in the story is coming soon, my friend. And it must declare itself loudly. The second turning point in the story is at the end of the second act. At this point, the hero faces the greatest losses, and it seems that everything is lost. And the third act begins, which will lead us to the resolution. What nonsense. I don't think everything is lost. I'm tired, angry, and scared. But not more than that. Your dramaturgy doesn't work. Get me out of here. I'm all done with it. All right, my friend. Agreed. The adventure's gone on a bit, but it's time to... <laughs> but this is not good. Uh, uh... Hey, <laughs> what have you got? Huh? So my ignominious adventure has ended. I doubt I'll be able to tell my friends about it. I'll never be a hero. And all because of a stupid cube. Oh no. This is too much. Hey you! Spineless! That was my cube! This cannot all be in vain. This adventure is not over. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, Wally. This is the climax. I haven't experienced such a catharsis for a long time. <laughs> The climax is the main part of the whole story. It is here that it is decided if our hero wins or loses. During the climax, the audience must experience a catharsis. 
a purifying empathy, as said by Aristotle. After the climax, our story reaches its inevitable resolution, and our story comes to an end. Yes, that's what I call total drama. One thing I don't get. What was this all for? Why? Well, of course. A message. The most important component of any decent story. How did we forget about that? We need to replay everything. Without a message, a story is not a story. Strength, the conflict, at jeopardy, something else? No! Wally! No! Where are you going? Wally! The message! No! I've got such butterfingers, I can't roll worth a hoot. My wings stiffen up, you see, before an earthquake. Let me try that throw again. I think that 14 tries is quite enough. Stiff or not, <laughs> it's time that we all moved on. Carlin, can you really tell when an earthquake's on its way? Don't be ridiculous. Well, of course he can't. Earthquakes, as well as other natural disasters, are absolutely unpredictable. He's just trying to talk his way out of losing the game. Tell her, Carlin. Let's see. The last time my quake warning system acted up, I was on by myself in the desert. My wings got stiff and the world shook like mad. Awesome! That's some fairy tale. In science's name, I demand you tell the mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. oh, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the quake in the desert lasted a little bit longer. Oh, hello, beautiful. I got a double. <sighs> I'm really tired. It's still very dangerous to head back home. There could still be destructive aftershocks. My wings aren't stiff anymore. Take my word for it. There are no more earthquakes coming tonight. Can your wings also tell us when there's a windstorm on the way? As a matter of fact, my wings only alert me to impending earthquakes. When there's going to be a bad windstorm, my, uh, beak itches. Actually, I'm getting some indication that a bad windstorm is going to be happening several states over tomorrow around lunch. Conveniently, there isn't a way that we can prove or disprove that. Well, we could fly to where the storm is going to be and watch the thing. Unless you're, um, too scared to go, that is. Nonsense. I'm not scared because we won't find a storm. Oh, there'll be a storm, all right. Wanna bet? You're on. Uh -huh. Can someone finally tell me exactly where it is that I'm to fly? We're flying to watch the windstorm that Carlin's itchy beak predicted. Watch the what? Windstorm. Carlin also successfully predicted yesterday's earthquake. Sweet sauerkraut! Why on earth didn't you warn me about this earlier? Windstorm flying is dangerous. We are turning this ship around. Don't worry, we will find no storm. He can't predict them. This will prove that Carlin is, as they say, full of it. See, there's nothing ahead but clear skies. But there was an earthquake when I said. Any kind of coincidence can happen. I can prove scientifically that earthquakes are an absolutely chaotic process, completely impossible to calculate or to predict. <laughs> Uh, Phoebe, our flyer, could it tolerate temperatures of around 4,000 degrees or so? I'll take that as a yes. School will start once we're deep enough. At the core of our cozy planet, there is a burning hot liquid substance called magma. Temperatures reach almost 4,000 degrees in the mantle adjacent to the Earth's molten core. I still don't understand why we have to dig so ridiculously deep down into the ground. Earthquakes happen way up at the surface, not this deep. Quite right, friend. But the reasons earthquakes happen are down here. First slide, please, dear colleague.
The planet's external solid layer, or crust, is only 40 kilometers thick. Compared with the rest of the mass of the planet, the crust is very thin. Forests, mountains, and oceans are all located atop this thin layer. The Earth crust is not all one big piece. It consists of separate parts, or plates, adjoining tightly at the edges. All the plates make up the planet's external layer. In general, it's all arranged rather insecurely. And this insecurity results in earthquakes. The burning liquid core moves all the time, and so do the parts of the upper layer floating on the surface. When neighboring sections creep up on each other or collide, the result can be an earthquake. Right, and since it's impossible to predict the movement of the planet's hot liquid core, then no one can make a credible prediction as to where an earthquake will happen. Looks like the ship's hull is starting to overheat. Head back to the surface. That's great. It would seem we don't have enough power left to dig our way back to the surface. Are there holes in the surface, like caves or something, anywhere? Are there holes? <gasps> holes? That's brilliant! There are, and they're called volcanoes! Hooray! A volcano is a hollow formation on the Earth's crust, which gets its name from the ancient god of fire, Vulcan. In truth, volcanoes are holes connecting the Earth's burning hot core with the surface, in spots where pieces of crust, the plates, collide. So the Earth's crust is made up of different plates. And what's more, it's full of holes. The ship is dangerously overheated. We must find a way to cool her down, or we are all going to cook. OK, so now we understand earthquakes. But what about windstorms? Where do they come from? Winds and windstorms are the movement of air. Warm air is light, and it goes up like a balloon. Then cold air comes in to replace the warm air. There would be no wind at all if the Earth and the air above it had the same temperature. But that's impossible, because the sun warms the planet extremely unevenly. Warm during the day, cold at night. In summer, near the equator, the ocean water starts to evaporate, and the steam rises to join the hot air. At a certain height, the steam gets cool and turns into fog, making clouds but the air becomes even warmer and goes higher still. Meanwhile, new pockets of cold air flow into the place the hot air just rose above. The more pockets there are, the stronger the wind is. This is how giant windstorm funnels are made. Sweet sauerkraut! <gasps> if you're wondering, my beak is itchy as heck. There's... No link between your nose and the storm. Our vessel got overheated while we were deep inside the Earth. And as it got colder, it warmed up the air around it. We're the ones who created this scary windstorm? If this windstorm manages to make its way onto dry land, it will be very bad. We can control the storm, to some extent anyway, until our hull cools back down. Wherever the air gets hotter, that's where the storm will go. We need to lead it farther out to sea. I... Uh, hide. Hold on! Ah! <laughs>
Mr. Storm isn't following us any longer. I guess this ship cooled down. Ugh. I think that's all right. We managed to lead the darn thing far enough away from land. <laughs> now we should fly the ship away from the windstorm. Uncontrolled storms like this are very dangerous. Uh, we'll go higher and fly above it. <laughs> That's the very first artificial windstorm. It's phenomenal. It's beautiful, isn't it? Breathtaking. Well, since we're the parents of that swirling thing, wouldn't it be fitting if we gave our creation a name? There used to be a tradition that when it came to giving a storm a name, they'd name them after a woman. In addition, they were given names that appeared in strict alphabetical order. Luckily, I've gathered information about all the named storms from recent years. Just let me check out which letter comes next in the master list of storm names. Hmm, looks like the letter is R. <laughs> I'm having trouble coming up with an appropriate name. Can't find a single Roberta? one. Regina, Rebecca, Rosa, Rosa, Romilda, Raquel, Rovina, Ernesme, uh, uh, Raylin, Rochelle, Rayana, Ray, Roxy, Raven, Rimaldehyde, Raylin, Raydan. Wunderbar! Rosa is perfect. Guess we should have thought of that in the first place. That is a dandy name for a storm! Thanks so much! Goodness! I'm flattered and honored! But of course, it's a shame my storm is an artificial one. All right, Moose. You have to admit that I predicted that windstorm. We made that storm. Your prediction had nothing to do with it. You can't prove that. My beak itched, a storm came, the end. So your beak is the chicken and the storm is the egg? Uh-oh, my feet is swelling. There's gonna be a tsunami tonight. <laughs>